Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate you all showing up to listen to me speak. Uh, my name is Tara Johnson, and I own a design agency, a web design and marketing agency in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, we work with small businesses to amplify brand awareness, boost online activity um, and visibility, and increase engagement. In other words, we serve as a sort of virtual marketing department for a lot of our clients. So to kick this thing off, how many people here are parents to tiny humans? Show of hands. Awesome. Anyone familiar with tiny humans? <laughs> Great. Um, I have come to realize that kids and clients are really similar, right? <laughs> Um, I would say the main differences might include having clients might have a slightly better vocabulary, um, hopefully a longer attention span, and their shoes are normally tied, unlike this guy up here. So these, of course, are my two kids. I have Henry on the left, he's eight, and Mackie on the right, he's five, and they spend a lot of time harassing and wrangling our chickens. Um, so here's the thing, clients and kids, they need a lot of managing of expectations, right? We have to keep them focused, and I would say most important of all is they just want to know they're special. They want to know that you're taking care of them. They want to make sure that you have their best interest at heart, and that <clears throat> I think is at the very center of your client relationship. Um, you've been hired to provide some direction and semblance of order to your clients. We all seek comfort and order. We all want to know, as my kids say, Mama, what's next? We want to know what's next. We want to make sure that there's a plan that's been put in place. And so that is essentially your job, is to provide information and to provide a plan. Whether or not your clients will actually utilize that information is a different story, but it's good to have that there. So before jumping right into managing clients, and of course blowing them away with your awesomeness, I'd first like to talk about putting a system in place for qualifying your leads. Um, so what is a lead qualifier? A lead qualifier is basically a boundary or series of hoops for your prospects to jump through that allows you to determine whether they are in fact a viable prospect. If you don't take the time to qualify your leads, you're going to waste a bunch of time, which I have done plenty of. So up here, you see, it's maybe a little bit difficult to see, but this is my website worksheet intake form. This is what I use as one of my primary lead qualifiers. Um, this is, of course, on my site. It's a live web page, and it's, obvious, it's actually a series of five pages, so it's actually quite lengthy. Um, I'm able to gather some key information from them. I'm able to figure out if they're willing to follow my process. Um, I want to talk about budget up front as well. So at the very bottom here, where you see the orange button, there's a range. There's a budget range, and it starts at $5,000. So it goes 5K to 10K, and it goes up from there. So immediately out the gate, any prospect understands that we don't build a website for less than 5K. And that's all right. We're able to get that out, it's clear, and then we're not wasting anyone's time. Um, and it's also nice to know, so if you get pushed back on something like this, it's obviously a red flag, right? If they're already giving you a hard time about having this hoop to jump through, you know that that might not be a great relationship. Um, there are a number of ways that you can set this up. I made it a little bit fancy, so this is Gravity Forms on my website, but you could do this with you could put together um, a Word doc, send it in the mail, fax it, whatever you want to do. Uh, you just want to put this in place and make sure that you're expecting something from your client out the gate to sort of gauge their level of interest and willingness to work with you. Um, and quickly, I just want to give credit where credit is due. This is not my idea. I got this from a gentleman by the name of Troy Dean of WP Elevation. Is anyone familiar with that program? Right, so WP Elevation, really quickly, is just a, um, 
it's a series of courses that are online. It helps you kind of gain clarity and put some processes in place around your business. Um, Troy is a really lovely human. He's become a friend of mine and he's a mentor. And this is one of the things that I've implemented into my business and it's helped me tremendously. So once you've gotten that um, worksheet back from your client, now it's time to sort of sit with it and see what you think. So I have an internal client scorecard that I use. No one else sees this but myself and my team. This takes three minutes to fill out, and there are three primary categories in which I'm judging the potential project. Um, I'm judging on budget, the project itself, and respect. And it's simply on a scale of one to five. So starting at the top, um, the budget, do they have money, right? Are they trying to do something that, are they trying to build a 10K site with $1,000, right? So where do they land there? Um, secondly, the project itself. Is it interesting? Are they going to give you uh, creative freedom? Is it going to open doors in the future? Uh, is it a good portfolio builder? Is it super boring, but the project or the budget is amazing? Um, and then lastly, probably the most important one for myself, is the respect piece. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have had this problem before, but I've had pushback from clients, I've had interesting interactions out the gate that just doesn't sit well with me. Um, and particularly if they're not willing to meet me where I am and respect our process, it's a no-go. So you add these puppies up, three to six is a nope, seven to 11 is a maybe, and a 12 to 15 is a, is a pretty solid yes. Okay, so before we jump into communicating and managing our clients, I'd like to first talk about making the pitch, getting the business, and gaining your client's trust. So first and foremost, whether it's by way of a proposal or a pitch that you're making to your client, um, I highly recommend that you make sure that all of the decision makers are in the room. So anyone who has anything to do with signing that check, you want them in the room. Um, I will, if there is a, um, if there is a meeting that's coming, coming along and I'm, I'm there and I'm prepared and I'm ready to rock and I show up and two of the three people are there, number three decided to go on a, on a, a golf vacation, I'll say, it's really nice to meet you guys, I think we need to reschedule, um, let's get another meeting on the books. And that maybe sounds a little bit harsh, but I think it's really <coughs> important that they respect my time as much as I'm respecting their time. Um, when you get into that room, you want to appeal to the emotional brain. They, first and foremost, need, need to decide if you're their friend. We don't, our brains do not like salespeople. We need to make an emotional connection first. So that's our right brain, that's our emotional brain. And in order for them to really um, absorb your tech information and getting into the nitty gritty of the project, you need to break through that emotional barrier first. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're speaking their language. You're speaking the language of their industry and their niche in particular. So make sure that you do your homework and stay within your client's shoes, right? And really speak to their pain points. Um, the brain has a very short attention span. It's getting worse and worse all the time. So once you've, they've decided they like you, hopefully, and you've made nice, and you've done some high fives and some hugging, um, get to the nitty gritty of the thing. Um, and the best way to resonate with your client is to gear your information to what's in it for them, right? You need to appeal to their right brain first, as I mentioned, by connecting the dots and appealing to their needs, their goals, their concerns, and opportunities that will arise once they start working with you. Um, once you've gotten that emotional brain's attention, get right into the problem solving and the pain points. Um, and you're more likely to have their full attention once you appeal to their right brain. And you want to focus on the results, because that's the point, right? You're going to get them results. You're going to increase their ROI. You're going to boost visibility. Whatever that is, make sure that you're speaking to that thing that they're hoping to achieve by working with you. 
Now you got the gig, hooray. Time to party, time to hit the bar with your colleagues. Um, but before you do that, I strongly suggest that you get your contracts in place. Make sure that they're crystal clear, leave no stone unturned. Um, trust me, if something bad is going to happen, it will happen if it's not in your contract. Um, I've learned the hard way, and uh, I, I say, go meet up with a lawyer, make nice, get it done, and then, and then you have it. Into the, you, know, you have it moving forward. So you want to cover things like payment terms, copyrights, uh, uh, required sign-offs, all of that stuff. Just get it done and you'll be happy you did. And you also want to get very clear on your process, right? So are you going to be using some sort of project management application? Are you going to be inviting them in on that internal structure, which could be dangerous? Um, make sure that you have a handle on that. And if there is, in fact, a learning curve, you might want to put a video together for them, some sort of video tutorial. One, uh, one thing that I tend to use quite a lot is loom.com, L-O-O-M. And so that allows me to walk through a process, like this is how you use the Google, or this is how you use Dropbox. And they can see my face, and they can see my screen, and you can share it with the link, and it's free, and it's amazing. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the, the onboarding. This is a document, the very first piece of information that I will send to my clients once they've signed on for a new project. This document sets the tone, of course. It gives them that comfort that they are being well taken care of. We have a plan. We're putting that plan into place. We've got their back, right? So. This is going to cover how they can best reach us, if there's a project management tool that they need to be mindful of. Um, it also sets, and this is really important, general expectations around feedback and revisions. How many of you have had, have had revisions go on for months and months, right? So, sorry, excuse me. Um, one thing that I've tried very hard to do is we're, we're doing two rounds of revisions, gather all of that information and all of your thoughts and feedback, and you're going to send that to me in one document or one email. That's it. Right? you got to keep your email free of craziness. Oh, this is just going to suck all the life out of you. Um, I also like to put other things in here like web care, so that is um, uh, recurring revenue. <clears throat> that we implement, and I need my customers to be very aware that they're going to go on this care plan, and here's some of the information. Because once you've built a site, that's when the work really begins. Um, and then, oh, and then there's also other key information that you can be gathering from them straight away. So once you get this document out, it's in their hands, and they have this to refer to into the future then you can ask them for Google login information. We need all of the WordPress dashboard goodies, uh, their cPanel, sure, you know, whatever it is, all of that housekeeping stuff, do it straight away. Because once you need it, someone's going to disappear and you're not going to get that information. So get it straight away. Um, I have a good friend who has set up a portal on his website to gather this information. Um, it's secure. He'll receive it via a secured email. Looks fancy. I think it's a fantastic idea. I've not done it yet, but I will someday. Okay, so getting into the deadlines, benchmarks, and expectations. Um, as I said in the beginning, clients are kind of like kids and they want explicit parameters and guidelines. They need to know what's next. They want to, they want to make sure you're working on the thing. So here is an example of a very simple timeline that I put together for a web project. I, you'll see that it's broken down into four steps. I have quite, quite a few um, additional steps now, but again, this is a very simple web build. Um, this informs them that Content is due at the very beginning, right? So it's a little tough for you guys to see. But on the left, the very first column, sitemap and interactive prototype is due. Content is also due. 
The second one is the proposed uh, design that also takes re required sign-off web development, which is the build itself, and then the launch, te testing, and then the launch. There are dates at the bottom, and they know what to expect. Um, I also require, as I mentioned before, digital sign-offs at every single stage. And I use a tool called Hello Sign, and it's amazing. Again? Hello Sign, H-E-L-L-O-S-I-G-N.com. And these, uh, so they can make digital sign-offs. You can see when they've opened the document. You can save templates, and they're all legally binding. It's awesome. And then this also hopefully motivates them to keep things moving from their end as well so that you can complete the project in a timely manner. So in general, I would uh, highly urge everyone here to consider integrating the following into their process. Um, one thing that I try very hard to do is to under-promise and over-deliver. Um, that is within respect to timelines in particular. So I like to be very generous and kind to myself and to my team. So I look very hard at the timeline itself so that if there's a lot of buffer that's built around it, at the very least, we will be on time. But most of the time, we're going to totally kick ass in terms of the time. We're going to deliver early and they're going to be blown away. Um, we also like to send weekly updates via email. You want to make sure that you're keeping your clients engaged and that they know you're doing stuff, right? Because there's so many horror stories out there of their, of their dev team disappearing, right? We all like to get the job and sit at our computer and do the thing. But I think weekly updates, and it does not need to be complicated. <coughs> it could be three simple lines. Tasks completed, incoming tasks, what we need from the client. Done. Um, email curfew, that's another one that's really has become quite important to me, um, is that my clients need to understand that when they send me an email, they will hear from me within 24 hours. That's all I can, that's all I can guarantee. I can't be shifting gears constantly and digging through email. I also do not email on the weekends. And we also have a, de a dedicated support email that they can um, they can do support at Alchemy 3, and they can get in touch with someone if it is an emergency. Um, if I do find time on the weekend to write emails, I will schedule those to go out Monday morning. I will not send emails to my clients on the weekend. That's going to set a precedent, and that's going to spiral out of control really fast. Um, Dormant clause. I was here, I think it was WordCamp last year, maybe the year before, and someone mentioned putting a dormant clause in place. Do you guys know what a dormant clause is? It's the best. Okay, sorry, <laughs> microphone. Um, so what that does is, in my contracts, I state, if I do not hear from you in 10 days, if you go, I mean, so people go on vacation, right? And they'll let me know they're on vacation, that's fine. But if a client goes dark, which happens because life happens and stuff, I totally get it. If it goes up to 10 days and I haven't heard from you, the project goes on hold, and you will have to pay me X amount of dollars to reinstate that project. I know that that sounds harsh and a little bit hardcore, but they need to, we're all running businesses. We all have work that's worth, you know, we have, we're valuable and businesses and we have families that we need to support and there needs to be that mutual respect right so time that I'm waiting on them for say content or sign-offs that's time that's taken away from me and from other uh, valuable clients content is the bane of every web designers existence. <laughs> um, as I mentioned in the beginning I've had projects go on for literally years. Has anyone else had that problem, or is it just me? Thank you for helping me feel better. Um, <laughs> so, as we all know, the con going back to the contract, make sure that the content collection is essential. If you don't receive it, 
you, you know, you could say, I'm going to continue, we're going to continue with the builds, we're going to implement dummy copy. We're, we've already, we've, we've managed our side of the deal. Um, please, and, and, you know, and you don't need to be unpleasant about it, right? You've given them lots of heads up, you've tried to work with them. You could always hire a copywriter, you could put that into place, right? An SEO savvy copywriter, you could build that into the quote. Um, another idea, which I think is really great, is running a content planning workshop. Uh, that is maybe a one-off that you could put together for them. You could recognize that they're really struggling with it and offer to sit down yourself, a writer, hammer it out, get the sign off done, and then complete. You can check that off of your list. So there is an awful lot of hand-holding, right? We all are very familiar with that. Um, but they need structure, right? We all need structure, and they're looking to you for that structure. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple tools for collecting content. Uh, these are all free, and these are all likely tools you are well aware of. Um, your clients need a safe space to put their things. And it's important that it does not go in your inbox because then it's just going to disappear. It's going to fall through the cracks. It just gets messy so quickly. So here, of course, is Dropbox, our friend that we all know and love. Um, I will send my links, and my links, my clients' links to uh, a Dropbox that I've organized ahead of time. And I keep it very simple. So here you can see it's organized by pages. Contact, services, home, about, um, keeps your inbox nice and clean. And then you can also leave comments in the sidebar if that's a conversation that needs to happen. Then it's still away from your inbox. Um, also, Google Docs is great for this as well because you can put it into editing mode. There's collaboration that can happen, so that's also pretty handy. You could put a Trello board together. This is something that I just recently started doing. Um, a friend of mine, Simon Kelly, showed this concept to me, and I think it's brilliant. So I have a couple clients that have purchased time blocks with me, um, which means, you know, they say they purchased 25 hours, and they're looking to me to knock a few things, check a few things off of their list. What they like to do is email me. They love emailing me three times a day. And so what, I'm, what Simon suggested that I do is invite them to a Trello board, keep it very simple. On the left column, this is the wish list. This is the brain dump. This is where you put all the things, right? They think of something, they want to email you. No, it goes here, right? Middle column is in progress, so they can see what I'm actively working on, or my team. Um, and then the last column, of course, is complete. These are the tasks that we have completed. Um, what I, my, my preferred mode of working right now with some of these clients is that we have this board, I give them an update at the end of each week, and then we have a set, very, very fast, recurring meeting at the beginning of the week, so say 10 or 15 minutes, where we chat about prioritization, what are we working on, what do I need to hammer out this week? And that's it. And then I don't need to hear from you guys. I'm going to go away and do the thing. You'll hear from me at the end of the week. So if they have something that they need to get off of their chest, they can do it here. If they're, co if they're curious as to what we're working on, they can see it here. OK, so now, how am I doing? How am I doing on time? Am I doing OK? Um, now that you have a system for collecting what you need from the client, now you need to establish Regular points of con contact. My brain is already shutting down. Um, because we all know if you leave a client hanging, they're destined to stray. Something shiny is going to show up, right? Someone's going to offer something way cheaper. You know, they're going to think someone has the answer. So you just want to make sure that you're paying some attention to them, that you think they're really special and awesome. So um, you'd be thinking about how you can add value to your clients. Maybe surprise your clients, especially your top clients, right? You don't need to do this for everyone. Let's be honest, you have your regular retainer clients that are really keeping the, the ship afloat. So you can't be everyone, you can't be everything to everyone. So think about the, 
people that you would love to clone, right? You'd love to have more of this particular client and do what you can to infuse as much value as possible. So I'm going to give you a couple of suggestions for ongoing value adds. Um, webinars, you could run, say, monthly webinars where you're um, showing, you know, you're maybe running a strategy call, but it could be a group call for your VIP clients. Um, you could put together a client dashboard. So for instance, if you are, if you have a, a client where you're managing their social media accounts or you take, you're doing SEO and you're keeping an eye on Google Analytics, you can give them a place to see everything, right? They can check in and see where you're at, how they're engaging, what's the level of engagement. You know, they can see those things on a nice dashboard. You could use something like Scythe, C-Y-F-E.com. Um, you could factor in consultation calls and check-ins, right? You could um, call them out of the blue and say, hey, I was thinking about X, Y, and Z. Maybe we could implement into your, this into your business. Um, and then you could also try a closed Facebook group for your key clients, your most important clients. You could build a little community around your business and that extra value that you're providing and keep the conversation going. So the project is finished, your clients are super pumped, party time. Um, you built a website and your customers are thrilled. You've increased online sales by 120%. It's amazing. So whatever the case, now is the time to strike while the iron is hot. So before you go party and brag to people about your success, I would get it while the getting is good and ask that client for a review. Now testimonials are great, you can ask for those as well, but reviews, that's where it really, really matters. Um, this is, you wanna, you wanna reach out, you wanna send them to places, legitimate places like Google and Facebook, Yelp, whatever, pick your poison. Um, you wanna work this ask into your process, right, so once you've project, everyone is happy, they're singing your praises, hey, would you mind filling this out and sharing your thoughts? And then, you know what, you can use, you can use those reviews as your testimonials. It doesn't need to be two separate asks. And then you're also boosting your visibility online as well. And then in turn, you can ask them if they're looking for referrals. Who are your ideal clients? What can I do for you? Are you looking for more people? I, would, I know a lot of people. I'd love to have a chat with them about the services you provide. And that's it, guys. That's all I got. Thank you very much. The, um, the, the slide deck is, of course, at the bottom, if you guys want a copy of that. Um, I don't know if there's time to 15 minutes for questions. Oh, OK. Anyone have questions? Okay. Yeah. In your dormant clause, that fee that you charge is that a, a resource? Can you come up to the mic, actually? Yeah, sorry. Hi. Um, in your dormant clause, the fee that you charge is that just the remainder of the project fees, or is that a like a restart fee that's additional to what you already agreed on in the scope? Good question. So in the contract itself, I mentioned the dormant clause. So it's there when they sign on initially. I like to make it very clear and highlight that in the beginning. Um, if the project does end up going on hold, then I will charge them. I'm struggling with the fee a little bit now, you guys. I'm going to say $500 for now. I'm thinking about boosting it up to 1000 but that's just, I. if they go dark, I will send them reminder emails. I need to hear from you. This is in your contract. And then it goes on hold. It goes to the back of the queue. And then for them to reinstate it. So that is a good question about the remaining amount of money that's due, you they also owe that to you as well, to be perfectly honest, because that should also be in your contract. Anybody else? So, right, so the question is, uh, what was the video cast tool that I mentioned? And that is loom.com. Loom, and it's free, and it's fantastic. Yes, sir. Um, what's your take on website maintenance after you've totally 
uh, finish with the client and, and where do you proceed from there? Okay, so the question is, what is my take on website maintenance? It's super important. So um, we have three tiers of web maintenance. You can cruise over to my site and take a look. It's on the, the left-hand sidebar. Um, so, but I'm not sure what you mean by take, but our, our approach is we have a recurring monthly fee for backing up the website, for um, maintaining the updates of plugins, for just keeping an eye on the over, we, we install uptime robots, so we know if, um, if the site's gone down, we know how, for how long, we keep an eye on um, the optimization of the images and the speed of the site, all of those things. But there's various tiers, and then there's also support time that's factored into that. So a first tier is 30 minutes, second tier is an hour, third tier is something that no one ever buys, it's like two hours or something. So yeah. that's built into the contract before you start the project? Or? So that is an option for them to sign on. I don't like, I really don't force them to sign on to WebCare. I give them a really hard sell. But the thing is, if they don't sign on, and then they, they encounter issues later, which is sure to happen, then they have to pay X amount of dollars for a website audit, because it's been out in the wild, I have no idea what's happened to it. So then if they change their mind, that's an additional fee to onboard to move to this care. But I educate them throughout the process, and I make sure that they're aware of web care and that it is essential. Yes, sir. Um, your advice on saying that you, know, you uh, will have a problem if it's not in the contract, right? So the yeah. question is, how much of legalistic uh, do you want to be? Um, and do you put all those in on the on, on the line and say that unless you agree, you don't move to the next page? Or how do you draw that line? Um, okay, so are you, okay, so the question is around, I think, contracts. <laughs> Is this around the sign-offs that I mentioned? Uh, yes, sign-off. Okay, great. So um, it, it does tend to be a very linear process at the moment. So right, the the next part of the process will not happen unless there is a sign-off. Um, something could come up; they might change their mind. Clients like to change their minds a lot, and that, you know, I make that very clear that if you're not pleased with, with where this is going, or if maybe something else has come up. Um, let's talk about it. I'll be happy to scope that out and give you a quote. But this is not this is not what we scoped out originally, um, and that's going to be an extra cost. But in order to complete Project A, these sign-offs need to happen. And if there's more uh, revisions, that's also an extra that's also an extra fee. So yes, those things are in my contracts in the beginning. Anybody else? Questions? Yes? Do you, uh, do you handle your clients through the contract or do you just send them to them and it? That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I love to put them in a chair and I give them snacks and I <laughs> stroke their face and I sing to them very softly. Um, I sit down with them. I do. I like to sit down and go through the contract with my clients so that it is crystal clear. Like I'm not trying to pull a fast one on anybody, um, and I let them know exactly what's happening, and I try very hard to keep the verbiage understandable. Um, there is a really nice structure. It's called um, Killer Contracts by Andy Clark. I don't know how I remember that. And it's, and it, you know, you can reach out to me and I'll give you the link, but it's very, like, clear and kind of cheeky and very straightforward, and that's a really nice baseline for these kinds of templates. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, so Hi. You, mentioned, I'm sorry, you mentioned earlier that you are you're doing like this, you're selling block of time yes. to your clients. Like, how does that look? Is it like no matter what, you can, they can say, I want ads, some of some AdSense work done, or is right. it anything? So um, that's, a, that's a good question. So there are, there's a certain scope of things that they can use that time block for. So that's usually around strategy, website updates, uh, maybe a little bit of content, which means I'll hire a writer and just build them for the time. Um, if it's, so I'm a photographer as well, and I also do brand design. So those are very different animals, and those kinds of things would not be included in the time blocks. 
But the way that I do the time blocks, I don't like charging nitty gritty. I don't like doing per hour necessarily. So I like to say I will sell you, it's a five hour, I mean it's still by hours, it's a five hour minimum, right? So let's say it's 675, I haven't looked at my pricing in a little while. Um, and it goes all the way up to 25 hours and there's a percentage, there's a discount that's factored in. Um, and if you want to hear, I'd be happy to talk to you more about the time box afterwards. Yes, sir. Oh, so there's a woman here and then you can go next. Sorry, I'm no sorry, she has a mic. Hi. Um, in terms of uh, website maintenance or care, um, we manage websites for businesses and we're adding to their blog. Mm -hmm. um, on a continual basis. Do you, do you do anything like that? Um, if so, if not, how's the best way to get content from them for these ongoing blogs? If you can recommend anything or I hire. I, I, I like to, I, God, content, man, it's the worst. Um, okay, so to answer your question about the maintenance piece, we I, I don't have any blogging that's included in, in the maintenance piece. It's very bare bones. The support time that they're paying for per month is, you know, switching out images, update, give them sending me content and me updating it. It's usually really simple things. Um, but I also, we do some social media management as well, and we have various packages that factor in content generation, the number of, you know, how many blogs per month, is it one a week, is it one a month? Um, and then I have writers that I work with on various levels, just depending on what the package is. And then we work together, and we also try to gauge how much the client wants to be involved, right? So we try to factor that in and kind of customize a package for them. I hope that answers your question. Yes, no, we can talk afterwards too if I didn't do a good job. Yes? Since uh, oftentimes we're small companies and, and we're potentially selling to larger organizations that have accounts receivable and accounts payable department. Mm -hmm. Since cash is always king, cash flow, what I always did is I write on the contract, I put a line that says PO number. You get a purchase order number assigned at before the contract is signed so that when you bill, you get paid in a timely fashion. That's an said. excellent suggestion. And then the other thing is on the onboarding meeting when you're reviewing the initial project plan, with great big bold letters when a payment is due. Yeah. So that you know, when we complete this, you sign off. I'm going to bill you, and you're going to pay me in, 30, in, in five days or whatever. Yeah, whatever and if it's is. if it's delinquent, we're going to charge you some money for that. So yeah. I put it right in the contract and right in the project plan because you've got the finance department doesn't know what the you know, what the buyer wants, what the marketing department wants. You know, you got all these different people, the, mm -hmm. the, the three or four decision makers. Right. And they're once they have your initial meeting, they aren't talking to one another. Right. And this all affects your cash flow. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. And we're running businesses, people. Right? Like, we have, we have families that we're trying to support as well. And um, it's important for to have that mutual respect. And it's, and it's good to sort of nip it in the bud straight away. Those are good suggestions. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, do you have a way of managing the use of these time blocks? Kind of going back to the time block idea. If someone purchases like 25 hours or whatever, and you, know, you have other projects going on and things like that, can they just say, "Oh, here's 10 hours worth of things to do"? Or do you 